Welcome, my name is Karen Coney, I'm the director of the Wireless Centre for Art and Politics, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to panel number two of Two Whole Things Together, curated by Bach and hosted and presented by the Wireless Centre. It is called on artistic coalition and institutional communal modality, and we are going to look at political and public networks and coalitions within modes of artistic public practice. Um, including in the discussions will be uh, topics such as co-situated learning and embodied study for coalition practice. By way of welcoming new audiences who may only join us now, let me please review just a few um, uh, items and give you a bit of background information. The collaboration between Bach and the Realist Center, um, as we were joking earlier, um, has been in the making for 15 years. Mm -hmm. For us, it's particularly rewarding um, to merge Bach's renowned public programming with us um, at the very center where we um, focus and uh, frame um, all of our uh, events and programs, including the artist fellowships, the publications, classes, um, not unlike Bach, through a research topic. In our case, the two-year research topics um, are determined by collaborations with artists and other uh, members of our constituency. And starting last fall in September, we began to examine protocols of engagement under the heading of As for Protocols. To hold things together today and tomorrow caps the first year of deep reflections on how to discover, unearth, create and enact more equitable protocols. Um, in this first year at the Verlis Center, we presented six seminars, um, and I would like to urge you to visit um, the video documentation of these seminars on our website. We think they're being posted on, in the chat room now, the link. The protocol discussions and seminars focused on languages and communication, on community teaching and learning, on biopolitics, surveillance, feminist revolutions, and most recently, the protocols of scientific and artistic experiments. Um, the previous panel this morning was dedicated to effective protocols of locality. And that too, you will be able to watch on video in a few days, but I just wanna highlight a few of the takeaways that were particularly um, uh, pertinent to our ongoing discussion. Maria Halayova spoke of the conditions that hold us together across various typologies and um, advocated for a locality through its modal expressions. Rachel Rakes, um, at also from Bach, um, introduced us to three new programs at Bach, a revisiting, a reformation of their fellowship program, a new program called the Community Portal and a new program called Prospections. Um, and I'm sure you'll find all of that on, on Bach's website. Mitchell Isaias um, pointed out and reminded us of the different forms of colonial violence and how they are absolutely and all of them interconnected. And it was for me particularly poignant um, that moment when you, Mitchell, um, brought in material evidence um, of struggles against colonial vi violence by pointing to books in a particular library that we had come across in um, Amsterdam, I believe, um, that looked at uh, the social and political life of the Surinamese um, uh, diaspora in, uh, in the Netherlands and contained books um, by African-American thought leaders and magazines such as Ebony. Norberta Roldan of Green Papaya Projects then um, quoted from uh, a particularly poignant review that pointed to the fact that Green Papaya exemplifies this type of space that works with kindred practitioners animated by impulses different from those of the market or the museum and those impulses come from within the local community. Um, Elizabeth Povinelli um, pointed to the effective nature of protocols and um, how our being and working together demands that we foreground at all costs, at all times, the infrastructures of colonialism in order to turn and develop a more robust practice in an attempt to decolonize the world. And that effective protocols have to always start from an acknowledgement of these infrastructures of oppression. 
And with that, I think we are at Artistic Coalition Institution Communal uh, Modality. We're beginning um, with four presentations, three presentations actually. And um, let me just mention that the biographies of the speakers are pasted in the chat room. This um, presentation is recorded. If you'd rather not be um, uh, visible, just turn off your camera and you can kind of disappear that way. Um, we are offering ASL and closed caption interpretation. I want to thank our assistants and our, the experts, I should say, the interpreters very much for joining us again. And we've been working with them for a number of programs and it's really wonderful to have their expertise available to us. Um, with that, um, I will just mention the sequence of the speakers. So Adelita Husni Bey is the first presenter. She is a Wireless Center Fellow and um, has developed or is developing a project called Schools of Pandemics. Rolando Vasquez will speak um, on behalf of the Deep Colonial Summer School in Utrecht. Emeka Okareke is a Jane Lombard Fellow also at the Wireless Center and um, the founding director of Invisible Borders, Trans African Photographers Organization, Lagos and Berlin. And then the last presentation is by Anja Vijaya, Farid Rakun, and um, I think Zaida Ziregar will join in the uh, conversation afterwards. The three of them were presenting Good School in Jakarta. And with that, um, Adelita, please go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us, um, holding space. And uh, thanks so much to BAC um, VLC for this kind of invitation. Um, and thank you to the ASL interpreters who are helping us um, make sense um, of this uh, through something other than the um, verbal via sound. Um, so I wanted to start off um, by mentioning sort of the two nodal points we've been asked to think about, which are in order the notion of kind of coalition and then the idea of holding things together in some ways as if things are kind of fraying uh, or perhaps um, they must be held together. And I think I only kind of came in late with the uh, through the last panel, but it seemed to me like there was a mention of things already holding themselves together somehow. And uh, I think that's really important um, as an undergirdling um, that we always understand things to constantly have the capacity to hold themselves together. Um, and I really like the shift towards the notion of coalition um, as the word that is privileged um, and that we're using today uh, instead of other words like community um, or other words such as um, allyship. Um, I like this shift and I will show you why. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, my computer tends to sometimes freeze. So in case it does, um, I, we have an emergency backup plan and Ariola will jump in, but let me try. So you should now be seeing my screen. There we go. Um, so as I was saying, the um, one of the, 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 the sort of questions that got me um, interested in the panel was this idea of coalition. Um, and for example, I want to just bring our attention towards the ways in which uh, words like allyship and community have been sort of overused, um, not only overused, but tend to sort of be performative, which is something that also the last panel sort of um, hin hinted at. But also wanted to say that the reason why I'm interested specifically in the notion of coalition is that um, it does something really specific. It, it talks about the kind of strategic tactical um, moves that people can do together. Um, it doesn't presuppose that there is um, a sort of community that one can kind of tap into or either belong to or not. Um, there's a very intentional sort of um, idea around the notion of coalition and is specifically a political idea that also says that things can, can change over time. And this is important when we're considering um, you know, how this panel is framed and what it can do to shift the conversation about um, arts intersection with politics. Um, so that's the first kind of thing I wanted to say. And this is a, a one page from a flyer that Fred Moten um, drew my attention to a few years ago. Um, put in together by put together by an indigenous group, um, and it kind of points to some of the problems 
um, with um, the idea of um, allyship, um, this idea of performative perhaps allyship uh, or forms of allyship that don't really consider um, you know, who gets paid, um, how or where the work gets articulated um, and doesn't take into consideration that these tensions are constantly kind of um, in the fray um, of, of, of making work um, in an institutional setting and pre presenting it like I will be doing today. Um, so yeah, so these are just two sort of initial points I wanted to make. Um, and then I wanted to shift on to talking briefly about um, a work that is related to the School of Pandemics, which I'll um, introduce shortly uh, in this very brief <laughs> 15 minutes we've been offered. Um, but one thing I found really um, interesting or one format I used really, I think um, in an important way over the pandemic period um, was um, you know, trying to shoot a film essentially over Zoom and to do that with a series of uh, people that I contacted who work as healthcare workers across two uh, different countries. So I'm now working and have been for a few weeks with two different groups of nurses. Um, some are working in Denmark and some are working in the US. Um, we are concentrating our efforts around understanding the idea and the notion of necessary work, what necessary work um, is, um, how it's articulated, and um, how, uh, you know, how essentially essential workers have been asked to um, perform uh, unsustainable tasks um, and sort of sacrifice um, their, their themselves um, and see this kind of sacrifice as constitutive um, of, their, um, of their position as workers. And that to, I think, nurses both in Denmark, which is highly unionized, they have one national contract, and nurses in the US, um, that, that was a sort of meeting point where we understood the notion of work um, as equated with sacrifice to be something that is happening now. So we formed this kind of coalition, quote unquote, online, where I invited them to do a workshop um, and I invited them to uh, talk to each other and me about their working conditions and also to shoot some film. So I gave them brief uh, film exercises and I guess this could be the protocol quote unquote of a framework of this uh, particular work. Um, and these are some of the images, um, films essentially that they send back to me. So in this particular instance, I asked them, or the instruction was to film the clothing that they used to go to work, um, but film it not on their bodies, um, but essentially in a, in you know sort of uh, folded somewhere or wherever they wanted to to shoot it and to shoot it with intention. Um, so this is the um, the films that I received in return, um, and. We, what we do is when we meet, we talk about them. We talk about how labor has um, changed over the course of the past 12 months for them, um, what it is that they're doing for the social reproduction of this, uh, the societies that they live in, the capitalist societies that they live in, um, and how their work is remunerated essentially by applause. So I am here uh, folding laundry. I'm working the next two days. So I'm getting ready for my shifts. And rather than tell you about my entire uniform, uh, I thought I would show you the most important aspect of my uniform to me, which is these right here, my compression socks. And so, um... When we gather, um, we talk about what it is um, that uh, the healthcare workers I'm working with have shot. Um, and we look at how these clothes um, essentially are forms of representation of their current kind of condition. Um, and how is this tied to my larger sort of project um, commitment with the Verilis Center? Um, is that I am looking at how pandemics have historically um, produced uh, moments of strike, uh, moments of protest, um, how they've produced um, raises in wages, um, and how they've produced um, like demands for the erasure of debts. So for example, um, one example I really do like to give is um, in 1378, 
in Florence. Um, and there were two moments here. It was one in 1348 and then a, a, a later version in, in 78. Um, but there was, a, there was a moment where the wool workers of Florence uh, rose up. They were called the Chompi at the time um, after the Black Death um, took away a large swath of the population. Um, the, there, there were demands that were being made because they were um, essentially workers that, with no representation in the local guilds. Um, so it's, you know, the similarities somehow became also striking with the nurses um, because what the Chumpi did at the time, which is what the nurses are preparing to do because the nurses are preparing to do, go on a general strike um, with their national union in Denmark and um, with smaller strikes um, statewide uh, in Illinois, for example, and in New York. Um, they're preparing to do that so that they can achieve um, the wages that they have been, um, you know, left without, essentially, and the wages have been taken away from them through this period of time. Um, just to mention something really quickly in Chicago, the nurses have been offered $900 um, as a supplement payment uh, for the entire time that they have worked this year, overtime constantly, 12 to 14 hours a day shifts. Um, so to me, it was interesting to kind of draw lines of flight between the moments of past pandemic um, and the current moment, and to also think through how um, people who are involved in social reproduction, workers that are considered essential, um, have dealt with um, the sudden uh, sort of highlighting of the fact that they are essential. This hasn't only just happened now, um, but it continues to occur. Um, so much so that um, one other example I really do like to give is um, the grave diggers um, from a small town in Tuscany called Montelupo, uh, which in 1631 revolted against the mayor who was refusing to pay their wages for burying the dead of the plague um, and decided to pile the bodies of the dead of the plague in front of the mayor's office uh, in order to be paid their wages. So. Um, and I always link this particular fact with um, the AIDS crisis as well, where um, people who had sisters, brothers, um, parents, um, friends, lovers die of the AIDS pandemic um, in New York and in the United States um, brought the ashes of their dead to Washington in an action. Um, I think it was 1992, I might be wrong, but it was called the Ashes Action and they brought the ashes of their lovers um, and um, friends to the gates uh, of the White House and threw the ashes of the dead into um, the White House lawn. So to me, it's really interesting to see how these moments of protest, the grave diggers bringing the bodies, uh, the AIDS activists from ACT UP bringing the ashes, um, the nurses striking, the Trumpy um, wool workers also going on a form of strike and not only going on a form of strike, but as they were storming the city in Florence to take over the government buildings in the 1340s, they uh, opened the doors to the prisons. Um, so and then this was something very particular about this um, revolt where suddenly there's also, of course, always tangled with these moments, um, of the question of abolition. So how do you abolish the current system um, that has highlighted the manners in which you were not only oppressed but exploited um, and what what happens then um, the doors of the prisons are flung open uh, people take over government buildings the Florentine elite at the time had left um, the town they interestingly also the elites uh, of many um, you know rich um, um, cities um, currently um, have you know, fled the cities, the urban areas. So it's interesting to see all of these um, different connections for me. Um, and my aim in some ways with the School of Pandemics is to build an actual temporary school, so build an actual um, installation infrastructure essentially, uh, to talk about these questions, to host workshops that can draw these lines together. Um, so here, for example, you can see on the left, um, a group of workers, of serfs, essentially, um, in a, a, a feudal representation. And then um, on the right, uh, people burying their dead um, in this miniature from the 1340s. 
Um, so to me, it's interesting to constantly kind of draw these parallels that, um, you know, make, make evident not only that history has a certain cyclicity, um, but also that the struggles are possible, real, continuous, um, and as evidenced essentially by history, reading it via materialist lens, uh, very um, successful at times um, and extreme and bring about, um, you know, very radical change uh, socially. So essentially to conclude, I have a couple more minutes left. Um, I just wanted to think about the continuation of a possible sort of twofold approach. Um, so online, as I've experimented with uh, healthcare workers, we can work across distant geographies. Um, you can in some ways do things like, um, you know, live ASL, um, and offer access in ways that may not always be possible in person. Um, but at the same time, what I've noticed is that there is, um, and this I think also forms that gives us the opportunity or the possibility to form these international coalitions, right? So the nurses are from Denmark, they're from New York, they're from Chicago. We couldn't have them in the same space. Um, so those are tools to keep in some ways. Um, but then, Something that is really important to me that has really come up um, also against the recent protests in Palestine um, and in New York that I participated in that counted hundreds of thousands of people in the streets is being a body, like the capacity to be a body in the street is extremely important and must continue to happen. Um, and so one thing doesn't necessarily exclude the other, of course, but um, I also want to point out that it's important not to let the flesh kind of disappear from the notion of the international, of the international dimension of coalition. Uh, that flash even in the international dimension of coalitions is really important. Um, and also that access um, that I was referring to earlier is this possibility to uh, you know, offer people who are have to stay at home, uh, people who are in bed, people who can't travel for whatever, you know, that offering the possibility of participation is super important, but it can't be construed um, as an acceptable form of physical isolation for people who otherwise would not be able to attend. So I think it's important not to um, equate access with, uh, you know, well, now everybody who, you know, would would normally be unable to attend um, can attend by being um, at home, and that's the only way we're looking after each other. Um, so, I feel like Karen came back on screen. That means I'm done. <laughs> but um, I I had a short video that I wanted to show, um, which is an extract of a film. But I'll maybe just describe what it says. Why don't you show it, Adelita? Oh, I show it. Okay, good. Every time you come online, I'm just like, oh, it's over. <laughs> but sorry, it's like, I have that effect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll um, I'll show it briefly. But basically, I just wanted to conclude with this image um, and um, end it there. But it's it's a it's just a short extract. But um, it's from a workshop I did with um, athletes. Um, young athletes who experienced injury because they were taught to compete. I mean, in the U.S., uh, it's, it's hard to sort of wrap things up and throw everything together. Um, but um, these uh, young athletes that I worked with, that I had the privilege of working with, um, had injured themselves um, as a result of having to compete from a very young age in sports. Um, as a way in the US uh, to get to university for a lot of them uh, have the possibility of studying. Um, and, and so we work together um, chronicling in some way injury um, and thinking through the notion of de-individualizing suffering and pain to form coalitions around um, what will be now, I think is well relevant because we're going to be going through a moment of deep grief um, a very deep global grief, um, even if it is unequal, even if it is, um, you know, un not felt uh, perhaps as strongly in some, in some places across some geographies, even if it is unequally dealt, it will be a moment of global, it is a moment of global grief. Um, and so I think poetry and chronicling injury together is a beautiful protocol. Um, to to work through and to continue to maintain coalition. So 
I'm just going to show that. And thank you very much. I did track, I went to three different junior Olympics, and then I won an engineering program. So a lot of these things, they happen in my life, so which pushes me to be the best, which can also cause me to crash down and break. Even in a team, even in athletics, it's all about, it's all about you. And like, as a part of a team, you're still trying to be the best person on that team. And so it's not really, you're not really striving to be, good as a whole, but be good as yourself. My head had felt gone. My body felt like air. My head had felt like ice cubes and water. My body parts felt like it wanted to separate from each other. My elbow and the rest of my body are at war and my elbow is winning. My elbow feels disconnected like a dropped phone call, no longer present. My elbow is non-existent like the rest of the game. displeasure, afraid, and disconnected. Because I personally feel disconnected from my team when I got hurt. And then like you kind of develop your opinions and your feelings like based on that fundamental teaching of like strive to be better and strive to like be the best person you can be, but also be better than other people around you and like find somebody that like is better than you and make a goal and like just try to achieve that goal and push yourself until you can be as good as them or be the, the best that you can be. The root of competition, of the word competition, is competere, which means actually to strive together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adelita. Um, I'm very glad <laughs> we saw that. So Rolando Vasquez would be next, please, um, of the De Colonial Summer School in Utrecht. Hello. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. I would like uh, to ask those of you who can turn on your camera to turn it on because I a bit, uh, feel strange to speak to myself. <laughs> so if you don't mind and can turn your camera on, that would be nice. Um, thank you for the invitation. I will talk a little bit about the, the 12 years of the, the Colonial Summer School in Middelburg that is now hosted at the Van Abe Museum in the Netherlands. Um, the Decolonial Summer School is now called the Maria Lugones Summer School because Maria Lugones was one of the key members of our summer school and uh, she passed away last year just after finishing her lectures with us. She was already unwell in the last lecture and the, next, the following week she, she left us. And so we adopted the name of the Decolonial Summer School Maria Lucones. And it is very, I mean, I was listening to Adelita and, and I think it is for us, Maria Lucones, one of the greatest decolonial philosophers, was also a philosopher of coalition. So her 
one of her major contributions have been the thinking of coalitions. And coalitions for her was a term for women of color or from women of color. Right, so I will, I will explain a little bit what she meant by coalitions because I think it's one of the central topics of these uh, days. And then I will, I will say how that connects to the summer school. And then I will, um, hopefully we, we pick up those topics in the conversation. Well, in her book, Pilgrimages, um, that is um, the only book that Maria uh, wrote, uh, she speaks of coalitions. I will read just a, a, two brief ep extracts. One is, um, so she says, she's thinking about coalitions here. To the extent that women of color names a coalition, it is a coalition in formation against significant and complex odds that all familiar keep standing in our way. Uh, so then she says the coalition or interconnecting coalitions need to be conceptualized against the grain of these odds. So for Maria, uh, coalition building was not an easy thing. It was not like networking or assemblages or producing, a, I don't know, a forum, right? Coalition was much more for that. And it had to do with this going against all these odds. And uh, then she would say, um, and I, I will explain, I mean, I won't read everything she says about coalitions, but I want to go to what I, understand as the core of her thinking on this. She says, systems of domination construct women of color as subordinated inferior servile. We can see each other enacting these dominant constructions, even when we do it against our desire, will and energy. We can see and understand these animations of the dominant imaginary but we are not sufficiently familiar with each other's worlds of resistance to either cross or travel to them, nor to avoid what keeps us from seeing the need to travel, the enriching of our possibilities through world travel. So I will explain it because I know it's difficult to follow. Um, so she says, people that are under the coloniality of gender, that are racialized, that are excluded from gender, uh, that's part of the coloniality of gender. In particular, women of color, she's thinking from the perspective of women of color. She says, we are overdetermined by this dominant logic and we are forced to resist to that dominant logic. But here Maria is saying coalitions is to go beyond resistance because resistance keeps you fragmented, keeps you separated from each other. You don't see each other in the resistance because you are separated through this dominant logic of difference, the dominant difference. And she's taking this from Audrey Lord, of course. So, um, so for her, the point of coalition building was to go beyond the dominant imaginary and begin to understand each other in our own terms, beyond the dominant narrative, beyond the dominant logic, the dominant base. So she says uh, that uh, this, um, she says, I will emphasize the epistemological shift to non-dominant difference. So to be able to think in terms of non-dominant differences implies an epistemic shift. It implies a complete change of framework of mind. And this is enormously important for the decolonial because the decolonial, unlike other currents that are also fighting colonialism and the heritages of colonialism, the decolonial as it's conceptualized from Latin America, from what we call Apia Yala, is has a proposal that uh, it doesn't want to reach um, 
well, the key term, I will just bring the key term first, is delinking, right? And delinking means that the liberation from coloniality is not to become modern or to become contemporary. The delinking is to shift the logic, to shift the epistemology and the aesthetics, the dominant epistemology and the dominant aesthetics. So the colonial critique and the coloniality is about delinking. It's not about pluralizing modernity or creating a more complex hybrid modernity or an assemblage in modernity that includes the former colonial. For the decolonial, the key is to delink, and Maria will put it, is to go beyond resistance, beyond the binary logic of resistance. And here is where coalition is of essence, because coalition means that you have to travel to each other's worlds, that you have to recognize each other's difference, and that these differences are irreducible. Very close to what Glisson will call the right to opacity. You know, where relationality is grounded not in a coming into a unity or entering modernity or fighting to be recognized in that model, Western model of humanity, but where relationality is about uh, celebrating and accepting each other's differences, right? So coalition is very significantly in uh, Maria Lucones terms and for the decolonial, a very difficult task and it's a task across oppressions that doesn't depend on the dominant logic to function, that actually delinks from the modern logic, from the modern colonial logic, right? So I, I wanted to make this uh, conceptual um, let's say, uh, conceptual gift that Maria Lugones leaves us with the notion of coalition from the perspective of women of color, right? And and she said it was enormously different, difficult for women like her when she was with Cherry Moraga with Ansaldua to join the Caucasus of Black women in the in the feminist conferences, because she says coalitions are very different because very difficult because we don't see each other. We don't recognize each other's differences. And so she was endlessly striving to undo those differences that come from the logic of oppression in order to reach towards each other, to create coalitions, coalitions that don't imply the reduction of difference. Right, so I, so I want to say that because it is very different than just creating a coalition where everybody joins with the same voice or it's also very different than a model of democracy in, in the sense of Western democracy or a networking or an assemblage. It has nothing to do with that. And it has to do with the task of justice or the decolonial task of justice that is healing the colonial wound, enabling the possibility of forming alternative worlds. Right? the worlds that have been suppressed by the logic of coloniality. So here for me, and for the summer school as a whole, um, it's necessary for us to stress that not every critique is a decolonial critique, right? So there are many critical thinkers and they are all fantastic and they are doing the work they have to do for their own localities, like, whatever, whoever is in the canon, you know, uh, Foucault, Deleuze, Butler, they are doing very excellent work, but their work is not decolonial. Why? Because they are not addressing the colonial difference and they are not concerned with coloniality, right? It's not that their work is not valuable, it's enormously valuable and we use it a lot as well in the decolonial scholarship because it's very useful to understand the logic of dominant power but it doesn't address the colonial wound. So for a critique or for an art practice to be decolonial, at least in the way Latin American scholarship has developed the concept for the last 25 years, uh, it has to address the colonial difference. It has to address the colonial wound, right? So, so the, the decolonial as a critique is a critique of the colonial wound and it is targeting healing uh, reparation, restitution, you know, this this is the matter of the decolonial, right? And uh, so, okay, 
I just wanted to make it like our broad uh, conceptual framework, taking the idea of coalitions and showing that not every critique is a decolonial critique, right? I won't have time to set all the main major premises of Latin America decoloniality, but maybe this will also help you to look towards it. We, there are many things on it, et cetera. Uh, okay, so the summer school, <laughs> I have three minutes but I will tell briefly the story. Um, in 2009, in the winter of 2009, I, I encountered Walter Mignolo in Chiapas in the context of a conference at the Universidad de la Tierra in Chiapas, the CIDESI. That is today a caracol now, today is part of an autonomous uh, Zapatista territory. And this conference that happens over the new year our conference of celebration of the Zapatista rebellion that happened in 1st of January. In this, it was in this ambience that I met Walter in a cafe in Chiapas and I told him, uh, we, I'm working in Middleburg, a city in the Netherlands that was one of the major capitals of slavery, of Dutch slavery. And uh, just next to Amsterdam, Middleburg was almost as important in terms of slave trade. And I said, well, I want to create a summer school because nobody in the college speaks about slavery. And nobody in the college speaks about decoloniality. It was 12 years ago. Now everybody speaks about it. 12 years ago in the Netherlands, nobody spoke about it. And uh, Walter told me, well, I want to do it with you, right? And that's how it started in 2010. And this uh, year we are having the 12th edition of the Decolonial Summer School that is always around the end of June, beginning of July, because the uh, 1st of July is a commemoration of the abolition of slavery in the Netherlands. So it's always connected to the local history of enslavement. And uh, the Decolonial Summer School has been a place where, in, in a sense, where people like Maria, as she said in the last time, was where she found company. So it is a, it is a place where we have created coalitions uh, across very uh, big differences because there are practitioners from many academic fields and from the arts, from uh, philosophy, sociology, etc. And But also from very different ages, for example, John Casimir, that is one of our faculty and colleagues is, I think he's 83 now and, and we have very young dancers, well, younger than me, right? That are also part of like Fabian Barba. And, and we are all, even if our biographies would not make sense at all that we will ever be in the same room or even in the same <laughs> train together, uh, we are all together thinking through the decolonial. And now through many years, we have been, become a community of engagement. And, um, and we have developed uh, I think important topics like decolonial aesthetics, um, the decolonizing of the university, the decolonizing of the museum have been debates very early on happening at the summer school that later on took a lot of ground in society, particularly in the Netherlands, um, but also elsewhere. Uh, we have developed pedagogies, uh, so the pedagogies of positionality, that I could explain in the conversation, the pedagogies of relationality, the pedagogies of transition. So we have been challenging how the university functions, right? I think it is a, it is embedded in the university somehow, but it is not part of any program. That's why it's a summer school. And I think it, it would have never been approved as a, as a course in, by, any, by any university. So we are in a way also using hegemonic structures for under hegemonic ends, right? Where we have been using this formation to create a dialogue, a conversation, and where we, uh, I will finish with this, where we have also um, experienced and celebrated how decoloniality as a vocabulary to understand um, the global and local realities that we are living, especially injustice and ecological devastation has become a vocabulary that enables this coalition building that Maria Lugones is speaking about, this world traveling, because it is a vocabulary that coming from the global south 
For example, coloniality is not a Western term. It's a term that comes from the experience of the global South. So such a such vocabulary has enabled people to talk among each other without going through the dominant logics or the dominant epistemology and has created relations that have many of the former students are after every summer school there is groups of students that form and that continue working together so it has created communities of practice through the years that are actually transforming things around the globe and what has enabled them is not to talk through Foucault or Marx or Gramsci but is to talk through the decolonial because they share experience of coloniality, even if they have very different biographies. So I conclude by saying the great thing of, of decoloniality is that it is not a program for the future, but it is an analytics that enables to say one no to the modern colonial system, but that, does, but that opens the possibility for pluriversality, for many yeses. Every yes has to be located in its own local history. So the coloniality don't design the new society, but allows for this one no to the modern colonial that we have been all under. So I will finish with that and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Rolando. Um, we look forward to the conversation as well and also to hear more about the pedagogic relationality and these other uh, terms that you brought up. Um, Emika Okariki is next. Hello everyone, good evening. It's evening here in, in Berlin. Yeah, I'm trying to get something out of my screen. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm going to share my screen right away. Okay, um, much of what I'm going to be talking about um, will be thoughts that I pulled out of this essay that I wrote on the Invisible Dust Trans African project uh, that I wrote in the context of uh, the Field Journal uh, of Socially Engaged Art Criticism. So I encourage you, given that, you know, the scope of this uh, symposium will not allow us to really explore all of that. Um, so I encourage you to uh, maybe like go to the link and read further. And the reason why I am choosing to um, focus on, on this essay that was written before uh, the pandemic just a little bit before it, 2019, and then published, um, I think, early this year, um, is to underscore the fact that um, it's important that we are careful about how we think of the pandemic as a, a sharp break, you know, <laughs> that, you know, there is the, you know, pre and post, and that applies to everything. And even the way we use the, the, the word global, um, these are things that have been problematized even before the pandemic, but now um, it has become hyper, especially with the sort of anxiety that has, um, that has become, you know, um, the reality of the, of the Western world. Um, I spent two months in Barcelona and um, I could see how, even though we are aware of the, of, of, of the situation and a lot of lives lost, but um, there's this tendency to sort of like, you know, close, uh, to close off and think that, okay, this is how the world is now. I think yeah, the, the point is missed again, you know, uh, when we think about it from, because we come back to that same, you know, hegemony of that inability to see uh, beyond one's own, you know, um, what Achille Mbembe calls um, 
centralized or enclosure, you know, um, one's own enclosure to see beyond that. And in fact, um, what, you know, this whole, uh, in, in my opinion, this whole pandemic um, calls us to do is, and lockdown is to really understand or really uh, grasp, have a better appraisal of how connected our world is and to move away from this notion of the global and universal where it means, you know, one whole thing for which everything that enters it comes to complete itself. So there is this presupposition that whatever enters into that universal is coming in already incomplete and it's coming to complete itself in this universal, in this global. And I think that um, for a project that deals a lot with borders, the pandemic was a, a very glaring, you know, example of how those borders are actually porous and um, all of us, we are all at the mercy of it. Now, um, another thing again, the first, you know, um, my first uh, um, also, like, would I say my first, in my reaction when I was told about this uh, symposium, you know, uh, or rather thinking about it in my head, about to hold things together. You know, the first question I asked is like, why the hold? You know, it feels like a tautology, you know, beside together. Why hold? Why this, I feel like there's a strain, there's a tension to put more pressure on the whole notion of together. Meanwhile, um, something as subtle as to come together, to be together. Now, what about that? What, what is that thing about holding? That's actually how borders were made, you know, to hold it together. Borders are walls. And I'll come back to why I'm saying this. Um, when I talk about um, various, you know, things that we should look out for in the relationship that going forward, you know, the kind of relationship that we have with each other um, in that, within that context of difference, you know. Um, anyway, so um, Invisible Borders is a project that was founded in 2009 uh, in Nigeria, in Lagos. I came, you know, with, together with colleagues, photographers then, founded, uh, the um, Invisible Borders project. And basically what we do is that every year we come together, we make road trips, uh, we travel across borders. And of course, this is a project that, you know, is a very 21st century project in the sense that it is looking to contest or to question those imposed cartographies. You know, that is the function of, a, you know, uh, the continental Africa. You know, so we've done many road trips. But in 2020, our last road trip was uh, in Bangladesh. And it, we call the project uh, the Trans-African Project. And of course, the trans, the prefix trans, which is what I'm going to um, touch on a little bit now, is, it, is, is, is um, as opposed to pan, pan-Africanism or, or, or pan-African, trans is, um, connotes transcending molar fluidity. So our last road trip was in Bangladesh and it's to underscore that the Africa that we think of today, the idea of Africa that we have is the one that, um, that is a story of journeys and has always been and it transcends, you know, the, the continent and all of that um, limitations that's been imposed on it. So um, our road trip in Bangladesh was really like the turning point for us to begin to think of how to free this notion of Africa from, from itself, you know, and to, again, not hold it together in that sense, because it's never been held together. It's okay for it to be complex. It's okay for it to fall apart and come together again, it's, you know, it's okay. And um, so, yeah, um, 
Now, I think that it's it's up for me to sort of like make a little bit of a delineation between Pan-Africanism and Trans-Africanism, the way we understand it. So if Pan-Africanism offers a container for uniting peoples of African origin under a common race, history, and destiny, Trans-Africanism, while building on the foundation laid by Pan-Africanism, seeks to become tentacular in his goal of affirming the great extent to which Africanness permeates or enters into relation with the world. If Pan-Africanism presupposes a foundational grounding in one's Africanness, Trans-Africanism involves putting one's consciousness into action in generating unique thoughts, experiences, and stories through remarkable encounters engendered by perpetual movement. And then this notion of movement is something that for me has become, um, well, it has always been at the foundation of the Invisible Dust Project. But lately, I've also been exploring that some more. For instance, I have with me here uh, this book by Thomas Nail, Being and Motion. And I think it's a very uh, powerful, if not a revolutionary work on philosophy, where basically the thesis there is to question ontology, to return to say, no, the whole idea of being is in and of itself a kinetic process. And that means that it can be arranged and move in different ways. In other words, um, we can, you know, the whole idea of, of, uh, of uh, how will I put it? Of, I'm looking for the right word. The, only, the whole idea of constructing a being, you know, and saying, okay, it's something that we can contest and we can start from that kinetic process that happens within it. So I see the work of many um, African um, artists that I know, someone like Otobo Nkanga, who is constantly questioning um, how, you know, things move, how bodies move and how things are uprooted and where they pop up somewhere else. And that process of, you know, questioning and and looking into how things become is something that I feel um, will be prevalent in going forward. Um, so, um, yeah, so I don't know how long I still have, still have four minutes. Um, I, I came here having like so many things listed out to, to say, but I don't think I will be able to finish it. Anyway, um, still on trying to give a sense of what trans as a prefix means. Um, the prefix trans by definition connotes going beyond transcending and in some cases implies a thorough change, such as dynamism and vigor, that from which something unpredictable emanates. It equally implies crossing back and forth like an osmotic exchange. And wherever there is an exchange, a boundary is traversed into unfamiliar spheres where another dimension takes place. Where another dimension takes on existence. Although this term has been used mostly in relation to economic factors as it pertains to particular geographic structures, such as in the case of trans-African highways, roads constructed across the continent by the African Union in collaboration with the Africa Development Bank aimed at promoting trade in view that it will consequently alleviate poverty. It could equally apply as a metaphor for the method of, or for the method of artistic exchange or any other exchange for that matter in Africa today. The trans-African artist is the artist whose sensibility transcends or goes beyond the presaved definitions of what constitutes art from Africa. They draw inspiration from exchanges between peoples of diverse ethnicities and countries within the continent without having to contest, compare, or seek validation for those sensibilities. They do not seek a definition of Africa in their Africanness because Africa is what they make of it and not the other way around. Trans-Africanism is the ability to transform Africanness into fluid forms that need not be defined 
It is not an outside covering, but an inside mechanism of networks and exchange. If today someone asks me what exactly is contemporary Africa, I will first speak of radiations, a kind of, a kind of energy which flows through the continent like continuous line. This energy, this radiation is what numerous people coin words to define. It has been there from the onset. And no matter how time changes, it surfaces in married forms. It is ever constant and reinventive. It permeates everything and everyone whose feet are rooted in the continent, continent soil and thus has long since become our nature. This radiation gives rise to the shared reality of the people of the continent. In the same vein, it is nourished and fine-tuned by the struggle of, to circumvent unfavorable situations which looms above the destiny of the people. It is what gives rise to the arbitrary, indefinable, and often paradoxical nature of existence in the continent. This energy is the unequivocal tendency towards spontaneity, the sheer extent of improvisation, that which flaws any form of predefined statistics. It is said that in Africa, the weatherman is always wrong. Why? Because naturally, people live shoulder to shoulder with the moment. And in between two moments, there are one billion ways of being. Living in this reality is like being in a space where living in this reality is like being in a space where everything is non-linear, shapeless. Yet this is the shape because it works. It reevaluates the defined and invigorates the stagnated. It grounds interactions in the present such that it seems far-fetched to base one's re reason for action on the awareness of the past or the assumptions of the future. This, however, does not mean that people do not make plans, for this planning is never incapacitated by predefined projections. Every moment is a standalone, even though one leads to the other. Therefore, to be African is to blur the lines between the possible and the impossible rendering the real state of being indefinable. It is to become conversant with, to ascribe value to the complexities and maneuverings of fluidity. And every time I, I read, I still come back to this whole idea of motion. But what I'm really addressing here is again, returning to Thomas Snell and this a need to question ontology, to begin from there to understand that it is in and of itself a kinetic process. I think this is, a, this is the, the biggest point that I want to make. I think this has become um, what is central to the invisible as part. This is the, the part we are looking to find where we, we the, the work we do is not just about moving or traveling, you know, because there's a lot of privilege that comes with that. That kind of, you know, let's travel here. Let's go from point A to point B. What Thomas Nell is proposing in this book is that motion preceded, that, that movement preceded that kind of motion from point A to point B, that uh, movement or rather motion is what brought A into existence in the first place. And that we should go back and think from that place, first of all. And yeah, so that's the main point that I'm trying to make here that I feel like this is, um, um the point that has been i feel like this is the point that has been missed that we are still looking it's still stuck in this whole idea of oh we are not moving we are not traveling we are local we are not international and i feel like uh this this uh um i, I feel like what is what is uh at stake here is much more than that um, the other day I was speaking to, and this is where I conclude, because, because my time is up. The other day I was speaking to a young Ghanaian photographer uh, in the context of a podcast we were making. And he, had, he has this latest project called um, The Things Hanging in the Air, Like a Rumor. And I found that very powerful because what he's doing is basically going back and saying there's all these ways we've been, you know, told history, very linear. But what if we begin to now assemble and put together all these things that has been hanging in the air like a rumor? Again, we come back to that whole idea of the kinetic process within 
you know, the making of being, which is you have to arrange. It's not only a kinetic process, but it's also a descriptive process because you have to name things. You have to find things. Those things hang in the air like a rumor. You have to bring them. You have to collect. So going forward, I also think that the work of the artist will be, you know, all this bringing together, arranging and collating and, and also taking things elsewhere and bringing them elsewhere, displacing and bringing them. I think these are the kind of sort of like kinetic process that I feel will, will, will lead to that so-called coalition that we are talking about. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Enrique. That was great. <laughs> um, so we are moving to different mode of presentation and we're actually going to screen a very short video, which is a work by Good School, the Collective and Contemporary Art Ecosystem Studies in Jakarta. And um, two of the representatives are going to join us afterwards for the discussion among the panelists and um, you, the audience. So let's watch this. I also want to point out the, the film or the, the work is a game and the questions embedded in it, um, they're also posted on, in the chat room. So I encourage you to check there um, at the same time and answer the, I think it's 12 questions. Enjoy. Untuk sesi kali ini, gua Ampiang dan juga Farid akan bermain kartu kolek. Ini adalah giliran gue. Oke, mari kita kocok. Oke, um, oke, kartu yang pertama. Momen dan peristiwa apa yang paling kamu ingat di kolektif ini? Untuk momen pertama gue, yang paling gue ingat adalah ketika uh, gue ikut workshop kurator muda ruang rupa dan dewan kesenian Jakarta tahun 2013 uh, waktu itu gue pertama kali harus ke ruang rupa dan gue waktu itu menyusuri jalan tebet timur dalam raya itu dan mencari mana sih kantor ruang rupa dan waktu itu gue berekspektasi gue mungkin harus mencari sebuah uh, bangunan mencari sebuah ruko dengan ada pelang ruang rupa di sana dan gue gak ketemu-ketemu akhirnya setelah bolak-balik itu Kemudian gue melihat suatu rumah dan gue berintuisi kayaknya ini deh ruang rupa dan yaudah dengan modal intuisi itu gue masuk dan ternyata eh bener ini adalah sih ruang rupa ini jadi itu mengubah persepsi gue banget sih tentang sebuah uh, kantor kolektif komunitas bisa berwujud seperti apa gitu secara ruang dan uh, momen yang paling gue inget juga adalah waktu itu ketika gue dan teman-teman gue akhirnya jadi pengurus uh, Jakarta 32 divisinya ruang rupa yang ngurusin mahasiswa. Kami udah pindah ke gudang sarina ekosistem dan waktu itu kami baru aja nger, men, uh, mengadakan closing ceremony festival karya mahasiswa ini dan setelah malam penutupan itu kami semua nggak nggak pulang kami nginep di tempat art kolektif kampung itu jadi kami ngambil bangku ngambil terpal ngambil meja untuk tidur, untuk jadi kasur tempat tidur kami dan waktu itu gue inget banget siang itu ketika gue bangun gue ngeliat teman-teman gue masih di sana dan kita semua masih pada ngorok masih pada tidur dan gue apa ya gue sedikit bahagia melihat melihat itu semua karena gue waktu itu merasa wah kita capek bersama kita senang-senang bersama untuk mengerjakan ini nih gitu dan itu momen yang paling berkesan buat gue oke okay. mari kita adu Pertanyaan pertama Apakah kamu pernah berpikir menyesal berkolektif? Uh, <tuh> kalau buat Gua sih uh, Bukan menyesal Cuman pilihan itu terjadi Setelah menimbang banyak pilihan lain Dari menjadi arsitek salah satunya atau menjadi seniman di negeri orang uh, juga sebuah godaan yang pernah mampir cuman uh, akhirnya memang sangat dengan sangat sadar memilih untuk bergabung bersama kolektif yang bernama ruang rupa yang akhirnya sekarang jadi good school uh, jadinya kalau penyesalan mungkin tidak cuman 
pilihan itu dibikin dari dengan sadar dari awal itu satu sama satu lagi makin kesini makin jelas uh, kolektif macam apa yang kami maksud uh, saya dan teman-teman saya gitu juga uh, hmm. batas-batas yang bisa dilakukan dari berkolektif bahwa nggak bisa semua cita-cita dimasukin ke dalam kolektif tersebut semoga jelas terima kasih yang kedua halo semua balik lagi di kartu kolektif good school bersama saya Angga saya mewakili serum art kolektif kompon yang ada di good school ecosystem kali ini ayo kita bermain kartu kolektif saya akan mengkocoknya terlebih dahulu dan mengambil satu uh, kartu dan menjawabnya ini kartunya Pertanyaannya bagaimana ekspresi artistik kolektifmu? Oke, okay, di serum itu kami melakukan penelitian mengenai pendidikan yang tentu saja berkolaborasi bersama banyak elemen seperti siswa, guru, kepala sekolah, stakeholder, maupun uh, se, uh, berbagai macam ekosistem pendidikan di sekolah maupun sekolah formal maupun di sekolah alternatif. Dan uh, dalam proses tersebut kami melakukan banyak uh, metode artistik seperti misalnya melakukan focus group discussion. Jadi uh, kita mm, melakukan diskusi di sebuah meja bundar dan uh, kami merekamnya dengan video. Lalu uh, tentu uh, hasilnya banyak hal itu, misalnya dengan melalui instalasi, melalui karya partisipasi. Uh, juga melalui komik, uh, grafis, video, foto dan banyak hal uh, bentuk artikulasi yang uh, dilakukan dalam artistiknya seperti itu. Kartu berikutnya, oke, okay. kenapa kamu bertahan di dalam kolektifmu? Kalau gue mungkin karena gue nggak mau kerja kantoran kali ya, <laughs> atau um, atau juga karena uh, pada saat gue kuliah gue udah mulai kenal dan bekerja untuk ruang rupa untuk serum dan kemudian jadi gudang sarina dan pada saat gue kuliah gue juga pernah berpikir bahwa gue nggak peduli karir gue apa gue nggak peduli titel gue apa mau sebagai seniman atau apapun itu yang penting gue peng- gue rasa gue pengen bekerja dengan orang-orang ini gue pengen belajar dari mereka gue pengen bisa ngelakuin sesuatu bareng-bareng mereka dan juga kemudian gue merasakan emang kolektif itu juga sebagai sekolah gue gitu tempat gue bekerja tempat gue belajar tempat gue mendapatkan kesempatan yang kemudian menjadi pelajaran baru baru lagi buat gue tempat gue bisa gagal dan nyoba lagi dan um, itu kali yang membuat gue bertahan kali ya jadi ketika lulus dari kuliah pun secara natural secara alamiah dan ya cukup make sense untuk tetap untuk, untuk melanjutkan kerja kerja yang udah gue lakukan bareng sama kolektif kolektif ini dan itu sih alasannya yang kedua Bagaimana proses transfer pengetahuan terjadi di kolektifmu? E, transfer pengetahuan itu terjadi sebenarnya lebih lewat hal-hal yang tidak terukur Seperti misalnya penongkrongan, menghabiskan waktu satu sama lain tanpa tujuan e, Di bagian-bagian seperti itu sebenarnya pengetahuan berkolektif jauh lebih bisa ditransfer dibanding lewat proses yang dengan sadar mau belajar gitu uh, makanya juga paling nggak dari awal ruang rupa seringkali uh, bikin acara sebenarnya dari acara macam Jakarta 32 oke video pameran pameran workshop kurator dan penulisan eh, bahkan sampai waktu beberapa dari kami aktif di Jakarta Biennal kami melihatnya mengerjakan itulah lewat mengerjakan itu bersama-sama ilmu berkolektif itu sebenarnya tersebar tanpa sadar paling enak tuh sebenarnya belajar dan transfer pengetahuan lewat proses tanpa sadar eh, jadi ada 
satu hal di atas layer bawah sadarnya yang berkolektif yang di atasnya bisa bikin acara uh, bikin sekolah bahkan bahkan dan segala macam mungkin semoga itu menjawab pertanyaan uh, nah kita uh, lanjut ke kartu kedua saya akan memilih pertanyaannya apa nilai-nilai dari kolektifmu yang ingin kamu bagikan uh, yang pertama mungkin kekeluargaan ya jadi uh, kolektif di uh, serum itu bagi saya sudah um, lebih dari kolektif tapi juga sebagai keluarga di sana ada nilai-nilai uh, berbagi yang sangat penting ada nilai-nilai demokratis yang penting dan juga nilai kebersamaan yang sampai sekarang buat saya masih terus berlanjut seperti itu pertanyaan terakhir oke okay. ah lagu apa yang paling menggambarkan kolektifmu nanti mungkin Farid dan Ampiang bisa menjawab juga lagu apa yang paling menggambarkan kolektifmu ini gue rasa uh, Roma Irama dan Rita Sugiarto santai um, gue inget banget pada saat malam penutupan Jakarta Biennale 2015 um, David Arigan sebagai DJ memainkan lagu pertamanya ini, lagu santai ini dan waktu itu uh, apa yang gue lihat adalah penitia paten Jakarta Biennale waktu itu terdiri dari teman-teman serum, orang rupa lagi istirahatnya, karena waktu itu pun itu adalah after the after afternya closing party ini gitu dan dengan liriknya yang ngomongin tentang uh, setelah bekerja keras, setelah berpikir keras, jangan lupa santai, sediakan waktu untuk bersantai dan itu gue rasa lagu itu jadinya apa ya meresap dengan cara yang cara yang spesial gitu loh karena kayak wah setelah kita bekerja bersama dan Jakarta Biennale sebagai Biennale yang diorganis sama kolektif ini kita juga perlu santai dan kesantaian ini pun juga jadi the whole rhythm, the whole mood dari apa yang gue rasakan dengan bekerja di kolektif ini gitu loh bekerja di kolektif itu memungkinkan gue untuk punya ritme kerja sendiri untuk untuk punya apa ya mekanisme dan cara sendiri dan juga membangun apa ya pengertian satu sama lain tentang apa yang bisa lo lakukan apa yang nggak bisa gue lakukan dan gimana kita cari middle ground di mana kita tetap bisa mengerjakan ini dengan santai dan itu sih menurut gue silakan diran yang lain Oke, begitu. Uh, kita lanjut ke pertanyaan tiga. Pertanyaan ketiga itu berkaitan lagu apa yang uh, mewakili kolektifmu. Uh, yang paling saya ingat uh, di serum, jika ada yang ulang tahun, jadi di, uh, kita akan menyetel lagu India, Happy Birthday to You, tapi versi India. gitu. Kira-kira lagunya seperti ini. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Jenny. Happy birthday to you. Dengan gaya congkak India. Jadi uh, itu yang yang humor itu yang uh, di setel lagu lagu itu yang menjadi humor buat uh, kolektif kami saat uh, salah satu anggotanya ulang tahun. Kira-kira begitu. Terima kasih. Sampai jumpa lagi. Lagu sampai sekarang masih uh, ngasih daria yang bom nuklir. Ada beberapa hal. Satu karena ngasih darianya sendiri bahwa dia adalah sebuah usaha lewat kesenian dalam hal ini musik untuk berkelanjutan sampai sekarang udah hampir empat generasi 45 tahun soalnya udah umurnya satu lagi waktu ke, waktu pertama kali salah satu hal yang pertama kali waktu kenalan dari ruang rupa adalah video klipnya Asung dan Om Leo dengan soundtrack bom nuklir bila bom nuklir diledakan akan musnah kehidupan di bumi
Well, that was certainly amazing and very inspiring. And it's hard to um, stay at the desk or behind our screens you know, for a little longer instead of taking off and um, enjoying that music. So this is all to say that um, we have about five minutes left. We're going to continue beyond the official closing time of the panel, which is at 2.30 New York time for at least 15 or 20 minutes. Um, but I just want to encourage you all to um, you know, feel free and comfortable and um, part of this family to a degree that you um, don't have to stay until the very end and you can catch up with us on video. With that, however, let me ask um, Farid Rakun, please, and um, Gesidia Siragar of Good School to kind of come to the stage or um, just uh, tell us a bit more about how this game came about. Hi, Gesidia. Hi, Farid. Um, and how you would like to contextualize it for the purposes of the panel. And then we're going to ask everyone else to join us for a closing discussion. Um, ask you know addressing your questions and maybe some others as well so for it do you want to take it from here uh as the designer of the car i think geisha should take that one. Oh, great um thank you about it well, thank you about it and everyone from plc and Buck and everybody who's still joining up until now um we're really happy to share with you our uh, module and game uh, from Good School. It's uh, it's called Card for Collective. It's derived from our let's say like manifesto and principle called Collective as School. Um, ever since the transformation from uh, Ruang Rupa Serum as a collective at their own place, and then we changed into Gudang Sarina, where we joined together to have a common space, and now we became a school which is like an artistic model and also our sustainability model. We think that collective is a school for us. Um, and then um, we also think that um, it's not a literal school, it's, it's a school for our own definition. And then we believe that um, uh, there is a bit a special thing when we join a collective and why we are uh, come together, why we are holding things together, which is some, some, sometimes it's like a faith and everyone has their own stories. And I think that this card acts as the as a tool to excavate, to, to bring that story from each of everyone. Like, why do you want to hold these things together? Why we want to participate? Why we, are, we want to have this uh, conceit? And then why we want to work together? I think stories is what actually the glues of all things together and then how we can um, Sort of like giving the magnet for everyone to have the place to have the session to actually tell in their stories about what what is happening inside of a collective instead of like seeing them as a group of people but to see them as a as a person also so i think that's uh, the purpose of the tool to have each of the member moment to have their own stories and i think farid do you want to add to that uh just a little bit maybe because like just today we will we look into like the etymology uh, very shortly in etymology, etymology of school as a term itself. So it's actually kind of like uh, interesting. It's very different than how we understand school today. So it's like uh, for it's almost like uh, uh, a way for workers to spend time together. So together, together instead of what we understand today as uh, what they call it, productive mode of citizenship, let's say. So I'm just going to stop there and then let everyone else take the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to encourage the audience to either raise hands or put questions in the chat. Um, Gesiada, I was interested because you seem to kind of take um, up what um, Emeka had alluded to or really the question the term holding, um, which we had debated as we do all titles, you know, Bach, Maria, and Rachel, and Ariel and I. Um, and I speak for myself, you know, the holding show has an intentionality and also a, indicates a degree of care um, that I don't quite see if it were just things together. So I'd be kind of curious um, to maybe hear all of you 
uh, speak a bit more on the notion of intention, which also goes back to what others have said about the coalition versus the community that just happens. Um, it also brings in notions of time and sequentiality and history and legacy and how to carry it forward. So I'd be curious to hear um, anyone who cares to respond to the question of to what extent can intention be helpful? Does it need to be articulated very explicitly? How do you share it? How yeah, I maybe thought about um, Maybe there's someone else that has questions. So please go ahead, whoever would feel like responding, and it might be Maria and Rachel. <laughs> I think like, you know, like Rolando pointed out um, in his presentation, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting because he was very focused on delineating something in, important, saying that it's not so much about doing together, coming together, you know, uh, collaborating, that is, there is something there. And it's, I think uh, the way I understand it closer to that is what Ashley Mbembe again in this book, Necropolitics. Um, he calls, you know, you know, being in common, as opposed to just, you know, working together. And that being in common is allowing. I think Emmanuel Duma, one of the writers who's uh, been in the Invisible as Rock project. I think the way he put it um, in one of his writings back, you know, is allowing, you know, your life to enter that person's life and that person's life enter yours, that entering. And, and of course, that's the journey. That's the, that's the precarious journey of self that we always have to make. And of course, you see it come back also uh, in Tony Morrison's uh, um, uh, The Origin of Others, where she talks about how you have to give up that enshrined self for that to really happen. And I think that this is what is really, I think you're talking about the intentionality and this is basically what is difficult there. I don't think it is the trying to, you know, put a, a form to what that togetherness should be. Just like I've seen in the work of, you know, Rangupa right now, there is a little bit of, I mean, we could hear a child crying in the background, we could hear. So, so it's not so much about putting a form the rigid form around it as it is about the intention to allow yourself to displace onto the, this other person's life and, and vice versa. So, yeah. Rolanda, would you care to respond? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emika. Uh, because definitely, um, I mean, I'm continuing thinking with Maria here, Maria Lugones. And uh, she, or also we in, in our conversations have been very concerned with overcoming individualization, uh, in the individuality that is produced by the dominant system. And this overcoming of individuation or individualization is because we want to overcome the condition of separation. So the, that individual is produced in separation in separation from the earth, in separation from the communal, and in separation from uh, the ancestral. And also, it, it becomes impossible for that isolated, individualized individual, if I may say, to travel to the world of others, to receive the world of others, to be transformed by the world of others, because it is forced into a false unity that is separate, that is in separation. So Maria would, uh, in her thinking, she would propose the, the term of the plural self, going towards a plural self and recognizing that we are plural, that we are not just one. And, um, and particularly, as I say, as a woman of color, this experience of not being one is very vivid because you are under oppression, but you are also with dignity and you are all of, all of those things and you're also crossing towards coalition towards the world of others and learning from each other, for example, and reaching to voice of things that have been silenced. So 
Overcoming individuation is also overcoming its epistemology and its aesthetics. So, so Maria, for example, in a beautiful conversation she had through the years with Professor Gloria Becker in the summer school, that was a conversation of coalition coming from the black tradition and the Chicano and the colonial feminism. Uh, so they were very concerned about how the dominant epistemology, no matter how sophisticated it is, or how critical it is, didn't give them a voice. How they were voiceless, even knowing the most sophisticated philosophy of the West. That was not a place where they could express who they were and even let's talk to each other. So this coming to voice is also the possibility of that holding together a space, for example, right? And the notion of holding space also, I mean, Nata Cairo in the Netherlands has worked a lot about that, and, and she thinks of that space as a space of care, of allowing, a bit like I make a saying, not designing the world or designing the system, but allowing for, you know, a matter of reception, of generosity, of care, that is a completely different politics. And, um, and finally, a beautiful concept of Maria I would like just to add in this conversation is the idea of the of becoming porous. So for her, it was about becoming porous, becoming permeable, right? permeable to the life of others, instead of becoming one. That is all this effort of identity politics, etc. So there is a strong critique of an identity politics that derives a lot in many cases from privilege, the privilege to choose who I am, is very different from the politics of positionality, where you recognize who you are because of who you have been through your community, through your relation to earth, and from there you take responsibility. So, um, well, it's a very long discussion, but obviously understanding the coloniality of gender means that not everybody can choose an identity and perform a different identity and be those hybrid spaces, but actually people are positioned and recognize their grounds. I also like a lot of Mika saying we are we are standing on the ground, you know. And and this is what senses when you were speaking about the lines of the radiations of Africa, right? And people also have fit into this ground. And this is about positionality, something we are also been thinking a lot with dancers where contemporary dance tends to be the forgetting of, of the standing on the ground and it just becomes a representation of form. And well, I stop there because otherwise we won't have more conversation. But uh, yeah, I wanted to add this and um, the big challenge of overcoming the self and becoming plural, moving towards pluriversality. Could I ask Farid and Prasada about the impulse behind um, the game video that you just showed us? Because Farid, you said very clearly that there was a desire to indicate um, and acknowledge the individuals that make up the collective. But I'm kind of curious, quite literally, what prompted the need to um, produce that and to show, showcase and foreground the individual members? Um, so the the initial idea to make the collective card is that um, during this um, during this pandemic uh, we have many postponed projects and um, there are many kind of like a collaboration and projects that we thought we need more approach we need to make another tools uh, to present our ideas and then to to make to make um, this digital windows seems like more closer, like what is the tangible things that we can have and we can play around to make us feel like we actually being doing something together, even though we are separated. So the idea to make a question card and then acting as if we are asking each other about the reflection, what is happening in our collective, because we thought that in the last one year is a really year about reflecting and then like what, what, what are we actually doing with our collective what, what is we actually why are we still doing this even though like we are separating because um before this happens we always work 
under one roof. We always work in the house. We always work in a in a close proximity. But when we are do, doing it in a very uh, separate locations, like what well, things that can bind us, that's why we need. We think that we need to make some tools. We need to make modules about how we can uh, that how we can foster interaction uh, within our our places within our home. So that's why we thought that the car collective car can be like the reason to trigger for us to have conversations about the collective practice. And also we thought that maybe other uh, collective members other than us would also uh, uh, can use these modules, can use these tools, you know, to make this, you know, interaction still happens among us. So, but maybe Umparit can add to that. No, it's good, you know, yes, thank you. I guess I'd like to throw it uh, over to Adelita and ask you, Adelita, whether the film that you did with the um, the uh, health workers that you know, perform necessary work was that a similar way of um, creating coalitions? I mean, you said so, but to use the pandemic and to um, uh, become kind of a uh, almost like collective that comes up with a device that allows each member of a community of care to recognize each other differently? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think there was a lot of immediate recognition. I think one of the, you know, central questions to this work, which isn't yet finished, I mean, when is the work finished? Um, but the film hasn't been edited yet, um, and we are yet to sort of meet and talk through more footage. Um, but I, I think one of the things that was really striking to me was the fact, um, or perhaps not that striking, but just obvious in some ways, um, that when the nurses met online for the first time, and they are obviously talking to each other across, you know, very different geographies, it's like morning in the US, it's the afternoon um, in Denmark, and they immediately, you know, could could speak to each other could could be in coalition over the question of their labor over the like exploitation that they've been subjected to it was not a question i didn't have to do anything <laughs> there's just a shared condition so i do like the um you know the, the the ways the conversation is sort of pointing to the question of a shared ground in some ways um or you know a shared radiation or a shared um kind of movement in some ways that comes from perhaps like forms of, of shared conditions. Um, and in this case are very like material conditions. Um, they're, you know, when a nurse said that they had to pack up their stuff from one night to the next and go and live in the hotel for a month, you know, everybody else was very empathic and knew exactly how to respond to that um, because they'd lived through the situation themselves. So I think coalition is also born out of, and I think a lot of the research I was doing kind of points to that, of like ways in which material conditions um, express, you know, sort of, yeah, be, because functionally we belong to different classes, we uh, experience the world in different ways through different genders and races, etc. But specifically, I think very much through our material condition kind of dictates as well, obviously, our experience. Um, and I think to me, what was striking is that you know, despite all of the perhaps identitarian differences, the one shared common condition was um, like the exploitation they were being subjected to as health workers. So I think there's a lot of coalition happening, will continue to happen through shared material conditions, um, which, you know, are internationally um, constituted as well. Thank you. Um, creation of conditions is also something that Maria, well, you brought up right at the beginning of presentations this morning. So um, being very mindful of everyone's time and being in very different spaces, and in some cases late at night, despite somewhat misguiding uh, background information or images that show a known <laughs> sky, I think we might need to close very soon. And I'd love for um, Maria and Rachel to share any last impressions they have or guiding words to um, the panel tonight, which I can also provide, I can give you more information over the day tomorrow. Um, 
we didn't pre uh, quite prepare i have to say so we're looking at each other's eyes uh, uh, rachel and i but <laughs> indeed tomorrow um uh, we're going to go into an extraordinary series of uh, uh, seminars uh, with the Free Thought Collective. We're going to look at the notion of um, spectral infrastructure. And I very much look forward to returning to this question of holding things together around porosity or not of this notion of holding. Um, uh, which, of course, needs to be looked at uh, uh, quite closely. Um, I indeed, much like uh, what Rolando already brought up, um, associate with that idea of holding space, right? Deep listening, uh, care, and coalitionality, um, uh, indeed, uh, from Maria Lugones. Um, and of course, on a very kind of um, experiential level, um, of course, we know we kept apart rather than together. And thus, to hold things together is a labor of figuring out how we can be together, but then indeed, perhaps as a, a plural self, or perhaps as Kader Atiyah uh, 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 calls it, individual collective, asking how can we be together without losing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And thus, uh, uh, I really greatly look forward to, to continuing this conversation on uh, this matters and many other. Great, well, thank you um, very much, Maria. I don't want to neglect to point out that the conversation will continue at six o'clock, and I think it's going to be a very, very natural transition to a panel that is called There Lies the Road, a dialogue about making art in a good way. And I just want to remind you that this is um, organized and put together by Ogarla Lakota artist Suzanne Kite. And um, she engages with questions of how respect and reciprocity with the non-human, um, such as in the Coda ontology, can inform art and world making in, as she says, a good way. So this begins at six o'clock. It's a conversation between her and um, several, collabor several collaborators of hers. And I think it'd be um, a lovely way to cap the day or begin the morning. Um, and we look forward uh, to that, to tomorrow, Friday. And I just want to thank you all very, very much again, Bob, um, wonderful partners and coalition partners, and also my um, essential colleagues at the Realist Center, um, Ayola Pierre, Adrian Ume, and uh, Wen Zhuang. So thank you all. Come back. <laughs>